No, it, it, to some extent, it comes down to having a sort of quasi-religious temperament. You know, the, the great philosopher, the two of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century, Ludwig Wittgenstein, the most important in the English-speaking world, and Martin Heidegger, the most important on, uh, in continental Europe, were both quite obsessed with this question. And Wittgenstein was just astonished. The miracle that there, you know, that it's not, he said, it's in the Tractatus uh, Proposition 6.44, the mystical is not how the world is, but that the world exists. And he's always talking about his astonishment that there should be some, a, a world. And he, you know, he himself later decided that the, the question, why is there something rather than nothing, is strictly speaking nonsensical. But it was still very meaningful to him. And he said it was actually one of the three sources of ethical value for him. Hmm. The astonishment at the miracle of existence, uh, the experience of guilt, and the third one's oddly, the, experience, the, the feeling of being completely safe. So these are, for Wittgenstein, all on the same footing. Uh, but I, I think, I mean, what, I think it's, it's a bad question because you can't get something from nothing. King Lear was right. But it leads to better questions. Why does reality take the most general form that it does? And once we have the final theory, is there anything further we can say about why the final theory describes this reality rather than some radically different sort of reality? And so it, it does lead to something true. It's like the, you know, the pre-Socratic saying, what is the world made of? That sounds like a silly question, but it, it led to quite a lot of scientific progress. It, are, are, we, are we getting at the, what might be a fundamental difference between a religious sensibility and a scientific sensibility? I mean, the scientists would say this is absurd to talk about something from nothing, whereas at least in the Abrahamic traditions, that seems not at all But I think, I, no, I think I what Jim just said, you know, neither Heidegger nor Wittgenstein intended to pose this as a research question that, that you're, su you're supposed to find a solution to. Mm -hmm. As you yourself just said, it was, they were interested in this question because, um, because the business of meditating on this question put you in some kind of mood that they took to be philosophically significant, that they took to be philosophically interesting, and which does has presumably have a lot to do with kinds of moods that you find in mystical traditions and, and, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So I, I don't think there was any disagreement, even including them, that this is, this is a bad topic for a sort of research project. Um, um, that's, that's not what's going on. We have on. to get the message to Lawrence Krauss. Though. Right, that's right, that's right. That's right. Yeah, right. no, there, there is a question why it's become very popular among a large number of physicists to think of the universe coming from nothing. Um, as epitomized in Lawrence Krauss's book, uh, which, which got a number of good reviews as well as David's very but bad reviews. Not, not just Lawrence Krauss, <laughs> even, even Stephen Hawking. No, I the model, the absolutely. The so so-called no-boundary model, where yes. the universe is just this self-contained thing. It has no beginning. Yes. Um, are there, and there are other yes. sort of self-creating so, yeah, universe it, models. Yeah, um, let, me talk, yeah. let me talk a little bit about that, because I worked with Stephen Hawking on this model. And, you know, Stephen has very, very deep insights into into physics and he's always able to th see things very complicated things in very simple ways so it was an amazing experience to work with him and he had this proposal for how the universe begins called the no boundary proposal and roughly speaking you trace the big bang if this is time you trace it back in time and then you sort of smooth it off at the beginning you you round it out so it doesn't have a singularity um, and uh, the way he formulated it, it's a very beautiful proposal, mathematically, very beautiful, and it has actually been useful in a lot of mathematical physics explorations. Um, but, uh, so, so I began working on this idea with him. I mean, I have an open mind. I don't mind if the universe begins from nothing or if, it, if there was a universe before. Uh, to me, this is, uh, science should just investigate both possibilities, and we've, we need to find out which one is right. So that was the spirit in which I started working with him. And uh, the, 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 par the following paradox arose, which is if you assume his mathematical way of beginning the universe, uh, and, and actually what it amounts to is sort of turning time into space, that you, you, say, you see time is something which just marches along. And uh, if you take it seriously, as, uh, uh, you, you can't begin time. That doesn't really mean anything to say time has a beginning, uh, because you'd have to have something which started time, and you know, what, how would the something work? So what Hawking does is mathematically is able to transmute time into space. And we all know if we've got a sharp ob object, like a cone, which a 
you know, has a point that you can just smooth it off. And essentially, that's what he does. He turns time into space, and then he rounds it off smoothly. And mathematically, that's rather a nice thing to do. So, so I started to work on this with him. And you know, literally, this is a universe which doesn't have a beginning because it's smoothed off. And you, it's hard to say where the beginning is. Uh, and you follow through the logic, and you discover that the most probable universe predicted by this proposal turns out to be empty. Okay, it's a universe which has nothing in it. Um, it has space and it has time, but doesn't have any matter in it. It's literally an empty universe. So that was the conclusion of my work with Stephen, and, and I, 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 I felt this wasn't a very successful outcome. Um, now Stephen continued to work on it, and he continues to work on it, and he wanted to rescue it by saying. So he agrees that that is the most probable universe. It's an empty universe. However, he says, there are no people in it to observe it. Okay, so uh, if you require that we are there in the universe, maybe that forces the universe to begin in, uh, with more matter, with, in particular with this inflationary stuff, which will drive its expansion and, and, and make the Big Bang and so on, make, make the radiation and matter and so on. And, uh, for me, that's a losing battle. Um, that you know, either you have a theory which which sort of is close to working, you know, or you have a theory that is so far off, you know, that that in desperation, you say, oh well, it's only our presence that rescues it. I'm sorry, you know, this is the tail wagging the dog. The universe is a lot bigger than us, and like I say, it is stunningly simple, and that simplicity is not necessary for our existence. We, the simplicity we, is a clue that something else is going on.